for those that may look at that as manipulation, what would how would you respond to that? It's not manipulation. It's like you're getting someone to say yes. A diplomat is someone who can tell you to go to hell in such a way to make you look forward to the trip. Putin comes to the U.S., he gets protection. So the deal is you take a bullet for Putin. I knew when I went to my room and they told me, State Department's like, your room's going to be bugged. Just know that. Nothing's safe in your safe. Tactical driving, a lot of shooting, fighting. It's everything you could think of. They teach you everything. But if I can't lift my own body weight, how on earth am I going to lift the body weight of the President of the United States? I came to the point where I called my supervisors and I said, you got to talk to the President. I don't think she should come now. I'm like, I can't secure her safety. This is our President's room and we found all this stuff? Like, You're not going to confront. Think about it because we do the same thing. Yeah. I, I can't. Everybody spies on everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's both an honor and a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. She did a short stint with the NYPD and then 12 years with the Secret Service to include time as a criminal investigator, protection details of Clinton, Bush, and Obama. She was a polygraph examiner. She is the owner of Beyond Bulletproof, which is an online training course that we're going to talk about, as well as the author of Becoming Bulletproof, which came out in 2020, but is relaunching uh, as of right now, i.e. March 12th, which I encourage you to check it out. She's the female Robert De Niro from Meet the Parents. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Evie Pomperis. No one's ever called me that. <laughs> that right? That's the first time. I like it. I like no it. Well, shit, I'm glad to be glad to be the first. Uh, what's the last full book that you've read? Culture Code. Culture Code. What's the gist of that? Culture Code, I read it because, like you, I'm an entrepreneur now. I'm in business, and I have people, I have a team of people working for me, and I needed to understand how to create an environment and where everybody could thrive. So... Coming from the background I came from, I, it, when you're in government and the type of work that we did, there's a hierarchy, right? There's a chain of command. But when you're in business, it's there, but it's sort of there. So you, I have leadership qualities, or at least I always hope I do, and I try to emulate that. But I wanted to be better at motivating my people, listening to my people, and having a culture that everybody wants to be a part of. And that's why I read that book. I said, you know, I... I want my people that are with me, that work with me, and not just directly with me, but my third-party vendors, other people, I want them to want to be there. Yeah. And uh, I do a lot of keynotes and training for big companies, and one of the things that I've seen, too, that they struggle with, turnover. Everyone's leaving. Nobody wants to stay. Everybody is unhappy. But what this book talks about, there's organizations out there to include Navy SEALs, organizations like U.S. Secret Service that people will trip over themselves and go work at, and they don't even care in a sense. Like, the last thing they ask is, how much do I get paid? Yeah. It's, you just want to be part of that culture so badly, and there's companies like that, Googles, the Apples, right? Why do people trip over themselves and want to be there? Because of that brand. And so I wanted to emulate that for what I'm building. So even though I'm not at that level, I... I care about my people and I want happy people, strong brand, and I want them thriving, not just everybody to be there in service of me and what my message is. Yeah, I think that's that's huge and important. And for the long game of being an entrepreneur, it's uh, critical. You know, uh, did you feel like the book gave you a lot of tools that way? Is a worthwhile read? It's excellent. Yeah. I, I, I recommend it to anybody, even if you're trying to lead people in some way, probably one of the best, better books I've read. Yeah. Well, really awesome. good. That's a good, uh, good recommend. Do you have a favorite quote? A diplomat is someone who can tell you to go to hell in such a way to make you look forward to the trip. Yeah, that's awesome. I live by that one. <laughs> I suppose that comes uh, not just in handy, but uh, it, that's a, a critical skill set, as, especially in the protection detail stuff, right? Because uh, you're interacting with people nonstop and, and run into rude people or occurrences where you may maybe have to tell them bad news or... Uh, things of that nature, and you got to be tactful about it. Well, I learned it. My boss, Ken Valentine, I can say his name. He's retired now. Yeah. He would always put out quotes for us when he would give us our timesheets to tell us how much we're going to work, which was usually like monstrous. 
And at the bottom one, one of the sheets, he had that quote and I loved it because it helps you deal with people because we always, sometimes we want to force people into, you know, we want to kind of sway our, our weight, flex our muscle. And what I learned is if you can get people to comply without force, you win and you win in everything. And so I use it to this day with everything. If I can get you to say yes to something that even you don't want to do and do it with a smile on your face, I yeah. won. Yeah. Would, uh, I mean, for, for those that may look at that as manipulation, what would, how would you respond to that? It's not manipulation. It's like you're getting someone to say yes, because otherwise you're just using force. Here's the problem with force. You can force somebody to do something, your kid, whoever. You can force them. The problem with that is it's, it works short term. When you force something on, upon someone, long term, they will hold it against you. They will resent you. So if you can get people to comply, even if it's something they don't want to do, if you can get them to see it from a different perspective, you win, and then they're also less resentful. You maintain the integrity of the relationship. So I don't see it as manipulation. But also, you're also dealing with bad actors in life. Not everybody's rainbows and unicorns. Yeah. You're dealing with difficult people, which is where initially we started using it in the U.S. Secret Service, criminal investigations, arrests, protection. No one wants to listen to you. I don't want to have conflict and get into a fight. One, I don't have time. Two, anytime you put hands on someone, it always goes downhill. If you can get people to comply without use of force, which is really how it started, that's the best. Is, is there a, instead of just seeing a different perspective and trying to convince them to say yes, is there a, a component of incentivizing them to do so? Does, does that play a role? So here we're talking about different things. Am I convincing somebody to do something in the short term or long term. The okay. difference is this. If I want to arrest you, you don't want to come with me. My short term goal is to just make the arrest in that moment. I don't care about anything else. If I'm looking for a long term goal, let's say maybe this is a better example. I would do interviews or interrogations overseas, terrorists or terrorist sympathizers. My short term goal was I need information. You have to be careful not to make your, your goal I'm going to sit and try to convince this person how great America is or we're the good guys or we're, we're this and that. That's a long-term goal that's trying to change somebody's belief and value system, which will not work. And so that's the difference. So if you're looking for short-term gains, I'm trying to get to X at this point, then that works, right? I'm trying to get to this, this mission, my mission. But sometimes people mix up their mission with long-term goals and I need to change somebody's belief system, mindset, values, you can't do that. Yeah. That is very hard and that takes a long time to do if you can even, and one, most people know this, people don't change because you want them to, they change because they want to. And also you have to think about what you're up against, somebody's DNA, the genetic makeup, how they were raised, their dramas, their traumas. To get somebody to change on that level is a very difficult thing and it's. I will tell you it's something I never try to do. Yeah, those are... Uh enormously great points and and i can see a lot of crossover into every other aspect of life in that same same vein that's great uh if time travel were a thing where would you go and why or when would you go and why man that's a good question maybe there's a couple of places i'd like to go to new york city i'm from new york i live there i'd like to see what it was like before it's the beast that it is now and i think i'd also like to go to ancient greece yeah to see you know the the philosophers of back then the aristotles the plato's or even around the time of alexander the great just to be in that that world i think probably those two yeah uh yeah i guess you i guess you answered it with alexander the great that'd probably be from a an emperor standpoint, the the period where you'd want to want to go. I, I actually talked about this with the last guest, and just be, since you're bringing it up, I'll I'll bring it up again. But uh, I don't even. I, I guess I know how. I, I was watching some of these um, emperor period pieces. I think it was on uh, Net, Netflix, maybe or Discovery. I don't remember, but uh, it's like four or five episodes, hour long episodes of of the different emperor periods. Really fascinating stuff, but. Which turns into a rabbit hole on uh, on Google, but um, I didn't realize like you can buy um, struck gold coins from that period, like 
you'd think like there's like five of them in the world and they're all in museums, right? But no, you can buy them. Like, so di the different periods, like the, the two that I would want, one is Alexander the Great, the other would be Marcus Aurelius. You can get gold coins from that period. Now, granted, there are thousands of dollars and some of them are tens of thousands of dollars, depending on the two kind of uh, rating systems are, are strike value uh, and then face value, like how, how good a condition they're in basically. So if they're four out of five or five out of five, then they're tens of thousands of dollars for these coins. But how, how cool would that be to have, I mean, I, I would throw them up there if I wasn't worried about them getting stolen, you know, somebody breaking in and, and stealing them. But uh, I would love to have coins from those, those periods. It's pretty, pretty neat artifact. I had no idea. Yeah. I assumed, yeah, right. Like they're all in museums. Are, yeah. Yeah. They're, I mean, they're, they're there. And I would say you can get silver coins from those same periods for a few hundred dollars. Now, like there's tons of them available, which to me is fascinating not to get off on a tangent, but just if you think about the world history that's transpired between then and now, the fact that there's any of them still in existence is mind boggling to me. You know, it's like, how did they survive all of that? I think uh, just to touch it too, to awesome. have that in your hand. Yeah. Pretty neat. Yes. Uh, what's your spirit animal? I don't know. You don't know. Are you an animal person? You're from New York. You can't be that, that animal oriented, right? Other than maybe the wolf wolf. Yeah. That makes sense. Wolf. I like wolf. In fact, I don't have a dog. I know I'm, but I always told my husband, if we get one, I want, you know, and I speak zero dog. So I know I, I come in with complete humility yeah. and I know I'm going to butcher this, but German shepherds, which is what we had in the U S secret service yeah. detail, that would be the dog I would want. Yeah. And he keeps telling me to get something else. And I'm going to say it because I think I'm correct. Please, everybody be kind. <laughs> Just be kind to me. King Corso. Yeah. Hey, guys, I know some people bitch about the ads. You don't like them. Uh, so we're offering for five bucks a month uh, early and ad free episodes of the Mic Drop Show also including uh, some bonus footage that's not in the episode that's published on YouTube or any of the audio channels of the guests and I either dicking around in the studio or continuing the conversation of stuff that uh, kind of is required to be behind a pay paywall, et cetera. Uh, so go on Patreon uh, for Mic Drop, five bucks a month, early episodes, ad-free, and bonus footage. What are the two key components for canine success? That's effective training and proper nutrition. Fueled by Team Dog brings those two components to your family and best friend. The perfect nutritional balance that results in a higher mental acuity, energy, overall vitality, and even an improved appearance. Every product you will find in my company's store was born from the battlefield and not from the boardroom. Let my life's work help you become your dog's hero. And so we're having this debate about what kind of dog to get. Yeah. And I feel like you should tell me. Well, I think uh, there's two things. One, uh, I, I do think that people tend to get a little too wrapped up around breed specificity in that, like, the breed is a great starting point, you know, but it's very generic. And I can tell you just from having been in the industry for a couple of decades that, you know, I've seen consummate textbook examples breed standard wise of every breed and i've seen something that you're like how is that a dalmatian or how is that a fill in the blank and everything in between you know so it's a good starting point um from kind of a genetic roadmap standpoint but the the more important factor is kind of where you source them from uh, in terms of what you're actually going to get and, and i don't think enough people take into account the parents the the 32 uh, predecessor from a, a genetic standpoint in terms of pedigree that, that came before that dog, how big of a role that plays. Um, you don't have to get all the way into like, you know, the rights inbreeding coefficient of what percentage of, of, uh, you know, genetic makeup each, each of the 32 prior ancestors plays, uh, of a role wise. But, but it is important to know kind of where the dog came from, what the siblings are like and, and what the dog is at face value. That's the first side of the coin. The other side of the coin is what are your goals, you know, which is really going to drive all of what the selection criteria is going to be. But it's really no different than starting a business, getting in shape, learning how to do a new skill, um, you know, whatever your kind of end product is. Like what do you see yourself uh, or, or where do you see yourself with the dog in a day-to-day -day routine? What do you want to be able to do with the Protection. dog? Yeah. So in that case, generally speaking, I would say – one of two two avenues if you don't want to put a ton of time into the training as far as the protection route and you just want a dog 
that's going to uh, kind of look the part and act the part and, and genetically just kind of turnkey wise have pretty good instincts. Actually, cattle dogs are, are great dogs for that. Um, I, I would say they they generally take less training in terms of just putting up a good barrier, uh, defensiveness, aggressiveness, et cetera, and, and keeping the riffraff out. Now, capability wise, I would say they're not as capable as Malinois and Shepherds. Um, but again, you know, for most people that aren't professional trainers that don't want to put a ton of time in or send them to a trainer at different periods as they're growing up, uh, they're a good option for, for that kind of uh, happy medium. If you want the full blown, you know, somebody kicks the door in at two in the morning and they're six to two thirty, hopped up on something and not scared of the dog, intent on hurting them, and a- absolutely capable of doing so, then you need not just a Malinois or a shepherd. Like it needs to be sourced from uh, somebody who really knows what they're doing, who's super selective breeding wise, and then is going to help you either imprint the dog and, and kind of work with you throughout the the first two years of the dog's life, or have some, you know, help you develop a plan in terms of who you're going to work with, um, you know, locally to, to accomplish those goals. The tough part with sourcing a puppy is no matter how well bred they are, no matter how good the parents are, no matter how good the litter is percentage wise, there's still that chance that it could be a total dud, just like with people. Um, you know, even when you're selectively breeding and, and you're playing matchmaker, um, you know, like if I breed two just absolute perfect specimens that are everything that I want in a dog and they have eight puppies, there's in, inherently going to be a couple of them that just aren't that great. It's going to be a few that are pretty good. And then there's probably a, a couple that are fantastic, you know, but it's just, you know, that's just how it works. So if you're, you know, grabbing one out of eight, you know, your chances of getting everything that you're looking for, they're there, but it's not 90%, you know, it's probably less than 50, you know? So, um, a lot of people ask me like, well, I just, you know, I want to, I want a puppy and I want to raise it from, from birth and you know yada yada and it's like I, I believe me I totally get that um, just realize that if that's what you do there's a a chance a, a significant probability that the dog isn't going to be as good as you want them to be you may screw something up in training um, and lastly like just the the stars may not align and you may not get everything that you want out of it um, whereas if you want you know a guarantee basically than buying one from you know somebody like me or there's there's a a number of other purveyors that that do what I do. They source the dog at at an adolescent or early adult age because you can test the dog to the the lengths of of which you need to to be able to guarantee that that dog has all of the genetic tools because you can't do that when they're six weeks old. You can't put them through a a civil defensive security scenario and and understand where that dog is going to be, obviously, no different than you could with a three-year-old. So and then, you know, I bring that dog in. I spend, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight months with it, depending on where the dog's at, what they want, uh, what the what the intangibles are, and then and then deliver the dog, spend a few days kind of getting them turned over and, and then that. So it's kind of a lot to throw at you there, but but it's all dependent on all of those things, you know, so. No, it all makes sense, actually, because I'm thinking as you're speaking, I'm thinking about the U.S. Secret Service dogs. Canine was a big element. Yeah. Um, and quite honestly, one of the the first line of defense when we had intruders at the White House, just the dogs. Um, so I'm thinking about the level of training, you know, how they would train them. I would see it, although I was never handler or anything like that. They were just so much a part of everything we did. Yeah. And so when you're talking about how to raise them and the training, that makes sense to me. And that's what I think of. I do have a question, though. Kids, with that breed, can you make them to be, I don't want to say aggressive, but to be that type of dog and at the same time to be okay at home with the children and yeah. everything like that. So what I would say is uh, you, you can't really make them be that. That's one of those things where genetically, genetically, temperamentally, they either have it or they don't. Now, one of the analogies I've used a, a number of times, both on the show and, and elsewhere, uh, is think of the genetics, and this is true with people too, think of the genetics of a dog kind of like an amp for a stereo and it's got a certain amount of wattage, right? Some amps may have five or 10 watts. Some amps have 200 watts. The wattage is the, the raw power that you're going to get from that. Now, the sliders on the equalizer, treble, bass, you know, gain, all of that stuff, that's the training, the environment, how you raise them. You know, so you can tweak how that power is used and, and all of that, but the, the power is, is what's going to dictate where you can get to with that dog. And so 
if you're working with a five watt dog, um, you know, that's super sharp and, and reactive, can you help by doing all of the right training, all of the right experiences, setting up the environment for success? It's going to maximize whatever you can get out of that five watts as it relates to the dog being temperamentally sound, which is probably not much. Um, and so if the dog has it and you do the sliders where they need to be, then yes, you absolutely can. And, and on the personal protection side, uh, I mean, those are the dogs that I source all, all year round for high net worth clients that want that, you know, they have kids, they, they're gone all the time. And so I would say they're out there. Um, but they're unicorns, you know, because it, it does stand to reason if you think of it from the dog's perspective, you know, a dog that's physically and mentally coupled with training capable of defeating a human being five times its size that's doesn't feel pain and is stabbing it with a screwdriver um, or trying to stab it with a screwdriver. That takes a pretty special animal to deal with somebody like that. So that same dog that has all of those qualities is probably not going to put up with a four-year-old smacking him in the nuts with a wiffle ball bat, right? Um, however, some of them will. Um, you know, it's just, it's finding that that right unicorn that, that you know, was raised with kids and other pets and, and in kind of a, a, a house type of environment while also doing a lot of sport club training or, or bite work style training um, and just temperamentally kind of has all the tools. So they're there. Um, that's, that's kind of the business I, I deal in, I guess. But um, what's something that you wish you were better at? So many things, I guess. Like I, I'm, I'm an unfinished person. Something I wish I was better at. Answering questions faster. Probably, <laughs> you know, I'm. I think I, I always try to be authentic and, yeah. and not to like say whatever. I think maybe a better. I don't want to say a better writer. I'm a good writer. I it just maybe a faster. I'll tell you this. My, and I'm good at time management. But I think as I've been growing. In work and business, I want to. I wish I was better at time management. Time management and delegating things to people. I do try to delegate, but sometimes I'll do it because I can do it faster. Yeah. So that's something I've been working on to let people around me do th do things, struggle with them, so that they, they can learn them, yeah. and try not to touch it. That's something I've been working on to be better at. Yeah. No, that's great. I mean, that's something I've learned the hard way too, and agree that's the short term versus long term is. Short term, it's faster, easier, better, more efficient for me to just do it. But in the long term, like you got to turn it over to somebody else. Uh, makes good sense. What's your normal morning routine? Uh, what time do you get up in the first three hours of, of your day? What does that look like? My morning routine is I wake up, I have a baby. So um, if she's up, I try to help with that. I, um, I hired my mother. Like I know it's her grandma, but I said, she's like, oh, I'll help. I said, no, 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 I'm hiring you. Yeah. I hired her. Said you're gonna be on payroll. I don't. I don't want a couple hours here or there. So I was blessed to be able to have that. So usually, sometimes she sleeps in. If she's sleeping in, I'll leave her alone. I have a husband who's just excellent. People say, "Oh, he helps you." I'm like, "No, I help him." Yeah. Just stand up. But I think, as long as she's situated, the first thing I do is I leave the house. I get out of the house. I don't work out in the morning. I, my, all my stuff is done in the evening. That type of stuff. The first thing I do is. Uh, if I'm working from home, I physically leave the house always. I want to shift that psychological thing where I'm leaving. So I'll go to like, I don't drink coffee or anything, but I'll go to a Dunkin' Donuts. They have these other drinks I get. I'll get my drink. I sit in my head in my car, planning out my day as early as possible. Sometimes I'll get up at five, sometimes six. Um, I come home, I sit down, I do work. And my whole day is work, 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 work or if I'm in the studio or traveling where I, wherever I am. And then in the evening is when I go into, I'm shutting it down, my workout, my meditation and all that stuff. But the morning, because I'm so on, I can't do all that other stuff. So I, I want to go straight to work because I've got, I don't know what it is. I wake up and I'm like, oh, I have this idea. I have this idea. I have this idea. Or one thing I do is if I have a problem, I go to bed at night thinking about that problem or I'll put that question out and I'll say, give me the answer to this problem. And I almost always wake up with a solution. So morning is out the house, no matter what, immediately come back and then do work or wherever else it is I'm going. Yeah, that's fascinating. And, and I would say that's, uh, 
atypical of most guest morning routines, flip flopped as you probably probably imagine, but I think it makes good sense. Uh, I will say, like I do all all of my stuff first thing in the morning, which I didn't used to do, um, but I do like doing that stuff at night also. And, and traditionally had had spent you know the better part of my adult life working out afternoon or even evening. But that makes that makes sense. You know, I try not to. I know a lot of people do that, and I had to really listen to myself and what works best. And I noticed that at night too, when I work out or I run, I run the, I don't know how else to say it, but I run the crazy out of me. Yeah. The whole day, the stress, the this, the that. I run it out or I work it out and I like it because it's it's out of me. Yeah. It's gone and then I can meditate, I wind down. And so that's really where I look at my performance and my performance is better when I'm doing that routine. Yeah, that no, makes good sense. That's, uh, that's worth trying for sure, I think. But if you guys are anything like me, you know, uh, trouble sleeping can be uh, something that, you know, affects how, how well the next day is and how productive you are. Uh, if you are having trouble sleeping, I've been working with this company called Dream. And if poor sleep is negatively impacting your life, I encourage you to check them out. It's Beam's Dream Powder. It's a science-backed hot cocoa for sleep. And uh, if you know anything about me and the things that I talk about on this show, you know that... Uh, Sleep is a huge thing, and dream has been a game changer. Um, you know, one, one of the biggest components to the sleep regimen and, and the morning routine that I have is incorporating this uh, Beam dream, coke, uh, dream Powder, which uh, this, this hot cocoa is phenomenal. Um, today, the listeners get a special discount on Beam's Dream Powder. It's a science-backed hot cocoa for sleep with no added sugar. Better sleep has never tasted better. Um, it's one of my favorite things to uh, wind the day down with. They've got chocolate, peanut butter, cinnamon, cocoa. There's 15 calories, no sugar. Uh, it's high, high quality efficacy and formulated to ease your body into rest, support all four stages of the sleep cycle, and help you fall asleep faster and stay asleep longer. Um, a lot of other sleep aids have next day grog in this dream. Uh, it's got an all natural blend of raishi, uh, magnesium, L theanine. Uh, apigen and, and melatonin to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and wake up refreshed. It's easy to add to the nighttime routine. Just mix uh, the powder into hot water or milk, froth it, and enjoy before you go to bed. If you want to try Dream Beam's best-selling dream powder, get up to 40% off for a limited time when you go to shopbeam.com slash mic drop and use the code mic drop at checkout. That's Beam dot com slash mic drop and use the code mic drop for up to 40% off. You guys know I talk about sleep a lot and recovery. Uh, magnesium is a big part of sleep, uh, but it's not only sleep that being deficient in magnesium, uh, you know, can, can cause problems with. An estimated 75% of all adults in the United States are deficient in magnesium, and it's not just sleep. Uh, it can be digestion, it can be cognition, it can be energy, it can be recovery. Uh, magnesium is a vital component to our body's process. And with that, I mean, a whole host of other uh, issues can, can come from magnesium def deficiency. Uh, it can be a root cause of anxiety, depression, insomnia, stress. Uh, all of those things combined are contributing factors to issues that a lot of people face. Ned has come out with the product Mellow, which is a magnesium um, product. It's a powerful daily super blend, and it contains three of the most bioavailable and nutrient-dense forms of chelated magnesium on Earth. Two of the most stress-busting aminos, GABA and L-theanine, and over 70 trace minerals. Mellow is truly in a league of its own. It offers 300-plus benefits to help with better sleep and optimal health and wellness. It comes in four very delicious flavors. There's lemon, lavender berry, pomegranate, and naked, which is a stripped-down flavor-free version that's great for adding to smoothies, coffee, shakes, shakes etc. Uh, the folks at Ned have spent over three years developing their best-selling Mellow Magnesium Super Blend, um, and it's uh, you know they've really gone to the ends of the earth to create one of the best magnesium products on the planet. Become the best version of yourself and get 15% off Ned products with code MICDROP, all caps, all one word. Go to helloned.com forward slash MICDROP or enter code MICDROP at the checkout. That's helloned.com slash MICDROP to get 15% off. These statements and products have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease or condition. 
Guys, as you know, I work with a number of different products. Uh, one that's easily the, the most near and dear to my heart from a cause standpoint and a personal relations standpoint is uh, Bub's Naturals. Uh, the hat on the coffee table sitting right in front of me belonged to Glenn Doherty. It was a John Deere hat that I gave him. He had it um, when he tragically passed in Benghazi. And uh, I was fortunate enough to get it back from uh, one of the co-owners of, of Bud's. He sent it back to me uh, to, to be able to keep. Um, Bub's Naturals is a tribute to, to Glenn. Um, he was one of everybody's, he was kind of that guy that was everybody's best friend. I, I met several people that considered him his best friend, and he was a guy that was impossible not to like and uh, just you know caused happy waves that, that rippled through every community he was ever a part of. Uh, his nickname was was Bub, and that's where Bub's Naturals comes from. But it's a lifestyle brand. It's inspired by Glenn. Uh, they give a ton to charity. Um, they've donated over $200,000 to charitable causes since their inception in 2018. On Veterans Day, 100% of the proceeds go to the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation, which does phenomenal work helping uh, active duty uh, and children of uh, lost active duty members uh, go to go to college or scholarships that they've donated a ton, and they also uh, are heavy into the recreation space of of helping people do do that because that's what uh, Bub was all about. They have collagen peptides, which I put into um, my morning routine every single morning, as well as the functional creamer slash MCT oil that goes into it as well. Uh, they have hydrate or dye electric uh, electrolyte drink mixes, which are great for uh, pre-workout, during workout, and post-workout uh, to get all the uh, uh, added sodium, potassium, uh, magnesium, et cetera, that's required when you deplete it. Uh, and they now have Bub's Brew, which is a specialty organic coffee that uh, is also very, very good. It's USDA, or USDA organic fair trade uh, it's Whole30 approved, which is the first time that's happened. It's free of yeast, mold, and aflatoxins. Small lot roasted, guaranteed fresh, and it tastes great. Biggest thing is, is uh, you know, Bubs is a family company. Uh, the way that they started uh, is, again, super close to my heart with him being one of my closest friends for a, a long time. And uh, I just can't say enough good things about that company, of, of the product that they put out, why they started, what they give back to veteran communities and the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation. Uh, and I encourage you to go to bubs.com. And now there's a landing page specifically for Mic Drop listeners. Uh, just enter the code MIKE, M-I-K-E, all caps, and you get 20% off your first purchase at bubsnaturals.com. So that's Three W dot bubs naturals dots dot com forward slash Mike, uh, and you can check out uh, the Mike Drop landing page and uh, go support an amazing cause. Um, so you're originally from New York City. Uh, I was born, yes. Yeah. Uh, can you walk us through kind of your childhood growing up in New York and what it was like then, and and uh, ultimately what led you into joining the NYPD to start? Well, my parents are Greek immigrants. And when they came to the United States, they lived, I was actually born in Harlem. Really? I was born in Harlem, New York. And right next to Harlem is an area called the Washington Heights, which back then was even worse than Harlem, if you can imagine, but it was. And that was kind of the immigrant minority uh, area where everybody would go. So they were dirt poor. I remember, I remember there was a photo of, my, of me as a little kid and there was just, it was a room with a ch two chairs and a table, and that's all they had, and a mattress, I think, on the floor. So we lived there, I was young. When they were able to save up enough money by doing their work, they moved us to Astoria, Queens. And that was a, a hub of where there was like a, a close community of Greeks. I think a lot of immigrants, what they do, they try to stick around their community, the language, and what they know and they're comfortable with. So that's where my parents ended up going. Um, and I, I grew up the predominant time there. And actually, although we had, when we lived there, I lived in public housing, which was we couldn't afford, they couldn't afford normal housing. So we lived in city housing. And what I remember are roaches. Yeah. Everywhere. I mean, you would wake up at night, you know, as a kid, you want a cookie, you want something. And I would have the, my mom's flip flop. <laughs> <laughs> I call it a pandofla in Greek, but my mom's flip-flop in one hand or my dad's because it had to be big. And I would walk into the kitchen and you had to 
time it, and I would flick the lights on and immediately be into flip-flap action. And as soon as I flick it on, you would see the roaches disperse, and I would just try to get as many as I could. As a kid, I didn't understand what that was that was home. But, you know, the, they were like in the cabinets. They were in our food. I mean, my parents did what they could to steal everything. Um, and then I go get my cookie in a sealed box <laughs> to make sure you, you seal that thing up. But that's how we, we lived. We couldn't go outside. It was high crime, a lot of drugs, where we grew up, public housing in Queens. And then over time, actually, my parents, despite them not having money, the one thing that they did is they did not let me go to public school. They were pretty brutal there. there. There was no way they were gonna let my brother or I go to public school. They put us in a private Greek school. So half our lessons were in English and half of them were actually in Greek. Oh wow! So I learned about ancient Greece and history and all these things, which I didn't realize back then. I was like, why am I learning this? I'm in America. But looking back now, I, I really had like college courses and philosophy and all that. That's really the essence of how we grew up and you know what's interesting? You asked me how I went into law enforcement. I don't know. I didn't grow up thinking, I want to grow up to be a cop. Cops didn't really help us when we were younger. Actually, I never saw cops in our neighborhood. Ironically, they didn't go to those neighborhoods unless something was really happening. So I didn't really grow up seeing them around. There was a lot of crime. And I, I guess you could look at it this way. If you grew up in fear, and it was always, don't go out, don't go this, don't talk to people, don't that. If you grew up in fear... One of two things happen to you. If you're, grow you're raised to be like, be afraid of everything and everyone, you either become more afraid or you kind of just develop a, and I'm assuming I can do this on this podcast, just like, fuck you. Yeah. I, I can't live like this. And over the years, I began to lean more that way. My father had that demeanor too, but to protect his kids, he was like, you can't go out, be careful. And I think with that, and I studied politics in college, I always knew I wanted to serve and to do something to serve. And I studied political science. I studied art actually too, I had two majors. And so then from that, I, I, I worked for a Congresswoman, Congresswoman Carolyn McCarthy, I was her intern. I did an intern, I found it like on some bulletin board in my college and I was a very, I was a kid, I was like, I'll do anything. And it was a, one of those free internships. I worked for her for six months, I learned so much. When my internship was over, I asked them, I said, can I stay? They said, you can stay but it's still free. I said, that's fine. And I stayed on almost two years working for free for her, her office while I went to college and I had my part-time jobs. And I think that really pushed me into service. And then from there you graduate college and honestly, I couldn't find a job. Everything was, back then it was called to being a secretary, secretary, secretary. And I thought, man, I can't do that. And so I remember being on the subway, New York City subway one day Subway doors open as I'm sitting there having this dilemma and I see this New York City cop and he's hanging out there and he's got his bare belly hanging out. Back then they had those and he's leaning up against the rails. And I remember looking at him thinking, I could do that. <laughs> and that night I went home. I didn't tell anybody anything. And I called 212 recruit. I said, hey, you guys are hiring for a police officer? And they said, yeah. I said, you know what? The test is next week. You want to come? I said, yeah. I didn't tell anybody anything. And I went and took the test, and that's how it all started. Wow. That's, that's an incredible uh, journey for sure. If, if we could, uh, there's a couple of questions I want to ask about just growing up in that environment before we get into uh, the law enforcement and, and uh, Secret Service career. But um, do you know about how old your parents were when they came here? My mother was 19, and my father was 30. My father was in the shipping. He was in the, U excuse me, the Greek Navy, and then he went to the Merchant Marines, so he was all over the world on the ships. Ships. He was a captain, actually. Oh wow! Did um, growing up, did you talk to them much about what it was like in Greece? Why they came here? Um, was there any of that? I didn't need to because they reminded me every single yeah. day. <laughs> Why you're here? Every day. Do you know I went to school no shoes? Yeah. And it was true. Yeah. You know what else they also did though? Every summer, because they could not afford daycare, we had my grandmother help take care of us in the afternoons when we got out of school and neighbors and. Um, but every summer, as soon as school closed, June, I think it was like 24, I remember the dates, school closed, the next day, we were on a plane to Greece, my brother and I, and we would be in Greece in the village, same village as they grew up in, up until the day before school started. Oh, we wow. would live there with our, our grandparents that were there. And I remember the one, my mom's village, 
we literally, the, there was no bathroom. We had an outhouse, and it was right next to the chicken coop. And uh, it was a hole in the ground with two bricks to the side. That was your bathroom. And our bath, the way we take baths, we would boil water, and we had a plastic basin that we'd put in the backyard where the woods were, and we would bathe back there. So I grew up seeing and knowing how they were raised. Yeah. Um, so I think they did it for two reasons. One, they, one, they simply could not afford daycare and they would, they wouldn't put me in anything where there was no per person that they knew it was New York. You really couldn't trust anybody at that time. And then two, they wanted to make sure that we grew up knowing our uh, identity. And so every summer we went there yeah. every summer. Wow. That's such a neat uh, contrast, you know, to make, uh, your perspective well-rounded and being appreciative of of everything that I think a lot of kids, not to their own fault, obviously, but uh, you know, I think most kids lack pretty severely uh, in today's day and age. It's true. Scheduling, taking a bath was something we scheduled. Yeah. And it took maybe an hour just to boil the water yeah. to fill the basin. All using the same water, right? We, My brother and I use the same water. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I would go first. Yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, was your brother older or younger? He was younger. younger. Um, in those summer trips to Greece, is there one dish that you remember the most fondly eating? I'm going to be very stereotypical. I love souvlaki, yeah. which is some people call it shish kebab. I, I go to Greece now. My whole family makes fun of me. They're like, souvlaki, right? I said, yeah. yes. Yeah. They're just so of good. Of all the things. Of all the things. I think, too, though, um, it's a whole other rabbit hole, but the food there is not genetically manipulated, modified. It's organic. Like It's just it's pretty clean. So, Food tastes better there. So even though I can get a souvlaki here in the U.S. or New York, it, it does not taste the same. Even the salads, tomatoes. Yeah. So when I go there, I really just, I stick to my basics. That's yeah. what I eat. Yeah. Is there a, uh, a, tr a Greek tradition uh, that stands out as being kind of the most memorable for you growing up? We have a lot. Um, I think Easter is something that always sticks out. Easter, we... We bless the home. We go to midnight mass, and you, 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 you light a candle. There's a ceremony where everybody, you go to church, and then uh, I know in a lot of churches they have lights now. When you light a candle, you pay to light a light. But we actually, they still do fire. And so when you go to midnight mass for a Greek Easter, it's at midnight, and it's all the Greeks, and nobody fits in the church. So everyone's out in this, this sea of streets in, in New York, no less. And they pass out the holy light that actually I think comes from the Holy Land, and they light all the candles, and it's kind of like this, 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 this ripple effect of light, 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 light. It's just a really nice thing. And then when you you when you go home, you get in the car and you have to protect the light because you want to bring it home to bless the home or give light to the home. And when you walk into the home, we always did this. You would take the 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 cross and the the fire and burn a cross into the the top of the, the, the border of the church, the, not the church, the home. And so when you go to any Greek home, what you'll see is it looks like the house caught on fire, but it's not. It's it's the symbol. I don't know. You said that, and just, that's always what I thought in the holy light. So that's something we we do. Yeah, that's a, that's a really cool tradition. I love the, the bringing the light home. That's, uh, that's powerful. Uh, I'm assuming some people have probably burnt their houses down trying that. I don't think so. <laughs> no, 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 they haven't yeah, done it. Been, been I don't terrible. know if any Greeks have done it. Yeah. I think maybe because they grew up doing it, yeah, so they're pretty so good at it. well versed at it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, man, it's such a neat, neat upbringing for sure. Uh, did you play any sports growing up? No, because, I mean, I, I did like, don't laugh. I did cheerleading a little bit. Um, I did anything that was free. Yeah. Well, my mother couldn't afford it. I always wanted to do karate because back then it was karate. And my mom, I remember, her, I don't have money. I don't have money. And I, I used to keep asking her because you're a kid, you don't understand. And then my friends did dance. and She'd be like, I don't have money to put you in. But in high school, in the Greek school that I went to, they didn't really have a lot of sports. So there was a small basketball team. I played there. I played softball. But it wasn't, I didn't have the opportunity to really play. Yeah. It was more the school did what they could for kids like me to have hobbies after school so I whatever team they would let me on <laughs> yeah I went to yeah were you a a good student grade wise I was up until high school yeah what, uh, what distracted you high school growing <laughs> up yeah. identity being distracted wanting to fit in all the honestly the dumb stuff that you look back now and you think why what was I thinking but you know I, I'm I'm thankful that I think 9 10 11th 
12, no, 10, 11, 12, I pushed my parents to send me to public school. Worst mistake I ever made. And that's where I kind of really fell off. Um, but then I realized enough when I was in the 12th grade, I was like, I got to get out of this. And so I made sure to go to a college that none of my friends went to. Yeah. I went somewhere that I didn't know. I didn't want to know anybody. What college was that? It was called Hofstra University. Oh, okay. It was out in Long Island, which was like really far <laughs> for somebody from Queens, New York back yeah. then. Now, maybe not so much. And so I just went somewhere. I was like, I'm not going to know anybody here and I'm going to get my mind right. Yeah. And your uh, degree was in? Politics? My degree was political science, international affairs. And then I studied fine art, the arts. Oh, wow. I love the arts. Do you have a favorite artist or a couple? I don't. I liked a lot. I mean, I, I, I studied Italian art a lot. I went actually overseas to Italy and I did a semester abroad and I studied art there. Um, There's just so many. I went to Firenze, Roma is where I went to school, American University of Rome. So I, I, I just love the arts Yeah. and just learning. Do you like Ferraris, Lamborghinis and Ducatis also or is that uh, I like the fast wheel? cars. Yeah. I don't drive any of those, but yeah. I like yeah. I like fast cars. I, th I think the Italians have, uh, from my perspective, the cars and the motorcycles kind of uh, locked down in uh, in that regard. But uh, that's uh, that's neat. Do you know what's interesting about Ferrari, Lamborghini? You bring this up, and I just shared this. I'm an adjunct professor, and I shared it with my students because first day of class orientation, because you want to inspire them to keep showing up and deliver. And a lot of them are lost on social media and TV. And uh, there's this. Um, story out there where they asked the creator, the founder of Lamborghini, I think it's Ferruccio Lamborghini, I'm, I might be saying it wrong. They asked him, why don't you make commercials for Lamborghinis? And his response was, because our target audience isn't watching television. Yeah, I've uh, heard that. It's such a brilliant response. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Absolutely love it. Um, yeah, great cars, no doubt about it. Um, all right, so you go to Hofstra, you get, uh, you study art and political science, um, and then you see the cop you go take the test, obviously you passed it. You join the NYPD. You know what else I did? I also took the Marine test. Really? Right around the time I- Like I, the ASVAB or? I think that's what it was called. Yeah. I didn't know. I went over, there was a recruiting office not too far from Hofstra. I think they came on campus maybe. Oh, okay. And I was like, oh, I wanna travel the world. Yeah. And so I remember doing that too. And I went to the, to the recruitment office remember the recruiter there when I actually went to the office. He said, why do you want to join the Marines? And I said, because I hear that you're the best, sir. He's like, goddamn right, we're the best. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know anything about military, yeah. right? transparency. So yeah. I took that test and I took the NYPD. But NYPD hit me up first, so I, I passed that exam. Yeah. So uh, what, what was it like day one, you showing up female in a predominantly male space, which seems to be a theme throughout your entire career? Uh, how, was it intimidating? Like, what was going through your mind as you walked through the door? So I'll tell you first, I didn't think about my gender. I never did, and I thank my father for that. He never, ever said to me, you're a girl, you can't do this. I never grew up hearing that. I never grew up hearing that from my mother or my grandmother. I did hear, hey, be a good girl. Yeah. Good girls don't, you know, <laughs> want to fight or this or that. Yeah. Um, so when I put in for that stuff, I did not think about my gender, zero. But when I went in the first week, I was in for a rough awakening. I had no clue. I heard, this is my ignorance, uh, academy, it'll be like college because I had just graduated yeah. college. And you go in and they are yelling at you. There was 1,500 cadets in my wow. class, 1,500. Yeah, and they weird. are yelling at you. They're making you stand in front leaning rest and in plank position. And I'm thinking, what is this? And I remember sitting there, I'm like, I don't understand this. And my first week, I was in tears yeah. and I almost quit. I had a friend of mine who was like, don't quit, it's a game. And he knew better, he was a wrestler. He's like, you don't understand. I said, no matter what I do, it's wrong. I'm always getting yelled at. I don't know, I just wanna help people. I didn't know. And I stuck it out and I'm glad I stuck it out. In fact, the first month, um, first month, 300, maybe more, about 300 people resigned. Oh, wow. They just wanted people out. They got everybody as they could in, I guess, you know, the best population that they could. And then their goal was to just out, 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 out. You don't like it? Go. They, they were happy to show the, you the door. Even PT. PT, I mean, guys would be running. We'd be running in there. It was called the Green, the green Mile. This, this, this green line around the gymnasium, this massive gymna gymnasium. They'd make you run it till you threw up. 
and you would go, you would throw up, and then they'd look at you and they'd be like, get back in there. I didn't expect that from the NYPD. I was surprised. Uh, training was extremely hard. It was eight months. Oh, wow. Eight months. So what was the attrition rate? Uh, 1,500 or, or so started? They, they would lose probably, I'd say, 500. Yeah. Um, I mean, they needed cops. NYPD, the, the, the max they've ever had is 40,000 police officers. Wow. I mean, it's the size of an army. Yeah. And so they needed those numbers. At that time, they needed those numbers. So I think maybe graduating class was about 1,000. Yeah. Um, but they were happy to see you go. They were looking at also temperament. You're putting you out in the street. They don't you know, want people who are going to cause problems. You're not there to, to, you have to have a good temperament with people. You're dealing with New York City. You also can't be afraid. Cowardice is a big thing. Yeah. Not everybody's meant to do that job. So they would push you. And if they wanted you out, I mean, they set it up where you probably were like, I'm, I'm done. Yeah. yeah. It's such a prestigious institution too. I mean, you know, nationally, it's easily the most uh, coveted, you know, police department. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's such a neat, neat path. So, uh, all right. So you graduate. Um, I know your time was fairly short with NYPD before uh, the Secret Service picked you up and recruited you. But in that time that you were with the NYPD, um, how would you kind of synopsize your experience there, generally speaking? I think the organization is great because there were so many avenues you can go into. They had everything. Like the NYPD was, they had offices. They have offices around the world. They have intel, they have vice, they have terrorism, they have, well, actually back then there was no terrorism yet because 9-11 hadn't happened when I went through the academy. It was what, like early 90s, mid 90s? It was 2000. Oh, okay. It was 2000. So at that time, everybody hated cops still. Yeah. I remember we would run the FDR. They'd take us to do the our run sometimes outside of the gym and you would run the service, the, uh, the, the highway, the FDR that runs uh, along the river. Um, in the New York City, there's also like an area where you can run and they would have us running in our, in our cheesy uniforms and our gym attire. And um, you would run as people are driving by doing 50, 60 miles per hour. And they would flip you the finger. They'd spit at us. They're doing 50, 60 miles per hour. And I'm thinking, how much must you hate police to be doing that? Yeah. And I remember the first time it happened, I didn't understand. I remember stopping and flipping the guy as he's racing by. And the, the recruiter caught me by the collar. He's like, you don't do that. I said, but sir, did you just not see what he did? And he said, you don't do that. I didn't understand. Yeah. And so I will tell you, I went in, I was very young. I grew up in the NYPD and in the U.S. Secret Service, and they made me the person I am today. They gave me, not that my parents didn't give me discipline, but man, I woke the fuck up. They trained me. They taught me to have values, virtues, integrity, to be a hard worker. There was no better schooling than that. Yeah. Oh, it's fascinating. Um, you were there for about a year? NYPD, uh, less. Less. Less several months, and then I got picked up. I had applied while I was there to uh, U.S. Secret Service, FBI, DEA. And so I was going through those processes. Actually, FBI told me, no, you need more experience because I was super young. DEA put me through their system. U.S. Secret Service, I just started passing all their stuff. I, they gave me one thing, written written exam. A written exam, I think at that time, it was like the SAT on steroids. And I remember taking that written exam. I was like, there's no way I passed this. Absolutely no way. I left feeling like I was the biggest dummy. Polygraph, I took my polygraph. Did I take one or two? I think I might have taken two. Left that. I was like, man, I'm a horrible human being. There's no <laughs> way I passed this thing. I remember calling my mother right after the polygraph in tears. Mom, I'm so sorry. I'm such a shitty kid. <laughs> I was a horrible kid. I'm sorry. She's like, it's okay. You're going to be okay. I said, mom, they're never going to hire me. It's okay. You try, you try. Um, but that hiring process for the U.S. Secret Service probably took a year. Yeah. Um, I'm so, did the NYPD not have an issue with uh, letting you go that soon after the academy? Like, were they kind of hot about that? They were not. I actually, when I got the offer for the position for NYPD, I went to... Um, where the headquarters were for the all the captains. We call them the white shirts. So I went up there because I didn't know what to do because at that point I was cruising in the NYPD. And I liked it. I actually went from just wanting to get the hell out of there to like, I love this place. And I didn't know what to do. So I went to this lieutenant and uh, he said, come on in. I said, sir, I got to ask you a question. I don't know what to do. I was offered a job with the 
U.S. Secret Service, I don't know if I should take it or not. And he said, you know what? You can always come back here. Oh, wow. He said, go. He's like, this is like a rare opportunity. He's like, I don't want to stand in the way. Nobody here wants to stand in the way. Go, go. If yeah. you make it, great. If you don't, come back. Oh, that's, that's awesome. I made the decision because he told me to. Yeah, oh, that's great. Um, so you say yes. I said Sh yes. Show up at the Secret Service. Walk us through that process. So you show up, you go to your field office. My field office was New York. And you wait to go to training. So while I'm waiting to go to training, they have me doing, they have me mirroring or shadowing some agents. They have you doing clerical stuff. They just have you there as you're getting ready to go. And I think I was in the office three months before they sent me to training. So training's two parts. First part is what they call FLETC, Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. That is where everybody goes to be a special agent for the federal government. It's kind of the training academy for the feds. You have to pass that before you go on to your agency selective, you know, personalized, specialized training. So you go through that training and it's law, it's ethics, behaviors. It's also a lot of driving, tactical driving, a lot of shooting, um, combat training, fighting. It's everything you could think of. They teach you everything. I didn't take a single criminal justice class in my life. I didn't need to. They taught me everything there. So that is what you do. You wake up at, I think, I would wake up at 4 a.m. or 5, or 5 a.m. we were on. This is, my, main, my, my memory's fading, but early morning, you're on, you're ready, you're in class, and you get your schedule of where you need to go every day. You're in your uniform, you're running. You know what they did, and I'm sure they did this to you, like, they would never, when they take us like on runs, they would never tell us how far, how long we were going. Yeah. It was just, I think that was the hardest part, part. You didn't know when the pain would end. Yeah. And so that was hard for me because I wasn't used to that. I like, let me know when this stops. <laughs> they wouldn't tell you. And you would, it wasn't like, hey, I just got to do up to this point or up to that point. It was just like this agony of like, I don't know. The other thing that was hard about training is at any point you could fail out. And that was really stressful. And I went from being in a class of 1,500 cadets to 54. Mm -hmm. So here I was a person and everybody knew your name. So the other thing that was big there is, I don't want to say shame, but everybody knew how everybody else did. If you sucked at shooting, everybody knew. If you failed a test, everybody knew. In fact, they would post grades up so everybody could see each other's stuff. So your performance was out there. And so I think... It definitely incentivized or scared me to really do better. I don't want to shame myself. But if you pass that, which I did, then you go to Beltsville, which is in Maryland, and that's where U.S. Secret Service training is. So now you go through that academy, um, and that's their shooting, which is probably some of the – I've done federal law enforcement and NYPD. That was the hardest shooting I ever did. In fact, the reason why they had you shoot like to this level was because – you as an agent, Secret Service agent, would likely be shooting into crowds of people because you're protecting presidents. And they had to make sure you like, you were really good. So shooting, something I loved, turned out to be a super stressful thing for me. And I loved shooting, but it was hard. And you had to pass that. Driving, same thing. Now you're driving armored vehicles. And the armored vehicles, especially the president's limo, the beast, that was a, that's a very hard thing to drive because you've got the inertia of the car and you're doing, they had cones and all this stuff. That was difficult. And then fighting, training, tactics, law, all that. Then if you pass that, then you graduate. When you graduate, you get sent to a field office. You don't have a choice of what field office you go to. They'll ask you, but they don't care. Um, I asked for New York and lucky for me, nobody wants to go to New York. So I get to go back home because nobody wants to go there. And then you start working as an agent in the field office. That's how you start. How long is the is Fletzy and the Secret Service Academy? Three and a half months each. Each, okay. Um, in the uh, Secret Service portion, or I guess if you if you compare the, the both the physical and mental kind of coupling of of how tough and, and pressure oriented it is, NYPD Academy, Fletzy Secret Service. Which one is the the most difficult? They were all hard in their own way. NYPD was hard because nobody cared. You were a body. They, it's not that they were being mean. They were just toughing, toughening you up. Probably Secret Service because everyone's watching you, you know? So if you get up on that pull-up bar and you can't do a pull-up, 
full disclosure, I went to U.S. Secret Service training in NYPD. I never had to do a pull-up. So I go to U.S. Secret Service training. First day, they're like, get up and do a pull-up. I can't do one. Everybody Mike sees that I can't do one. And I was like, this isn't good. So I spent every day doing pull-ups, practicing, practicing. And I was like, I'm going to compete at the same level, also as the guys, because there were different qualifications for women. I found out later that there were. I didn't know. And I was just like, I'm going to compete at the guys' qualifications. I was like, I don't want to hear anything from anyone that I should not be here. And so that part, so I would work out during the day, because our training there was during the day. I would work out during the day with my group, and then at night, because I sucked at pull-ups and I sucked at running, I would run. I would run, and sometimes I would grab some of the guys who, like there's an Army Ranger in my class, Navy SEAL. I'd be like, hey, can I, you know, I, can, I, can I work out with you? Can I run with you? Because sometimes the guys would do too, and they were like, come on in. So I, I had a good experience with that, but it was hard. Because yeah. I, was, I was with former Navy SEALs, former Army Rangers, and I had a few months, some, several months in the NYPD. I was an, at that level. Yeah. Now I got in, I spoke languages, I had other talents that I brought in, um, but I had to make sure people knew that physically I should be there. And they had, the, they had that right. Yeah. Um, do you know what, the, going back to some of the driving, um, well, actually, before I, I get to that, you mentioned there's a different uh, standard for women versus men. What, what's your personal take on that? Do you think that there should be? This is a hard subject for a lot of people. I'm going to be, I don't think there should be. I don't. And I, I want women to compete. I want men, women to do this stuff. But you have to physically be able to do, they should have one standard. It should be, everybody should be able to do this. Because the job requires this. So whatever the job requires, everybody should be able to do. So as long as those standards are fair and appropriate to what is required of the job, then yes, one standard. That's what I think, because if you can't run, if my runtime as a woman is lower than the runtime of my male counterpart, then if he needs help and I can't run there fast enough to help him, that is a problem. If I can't lift my own body weight, which by the end I was banging out my pull-ups, but if I can't lift my own body weight, how on earth am I going to lift the body weight of the president of the United States? Secret Service is a very physical job. If you look at all the other federal agencies, and there's no knock on them, you can do them from behind the desk a lot of them. Every once in a while, you go do a search warrant, arrest warrant. No knock on FBI. Great agency. U.S. Secret Service, there is a physical component to that, that you, you must meet those standards. So in that agency... I would say one line. There are certain places where it just should be the same. Everybody needs to do everything. So again, so long as those standards are fair and not designed to push out other people, I'm all for it. Yeah, no, I, I don't disagree with that. I, I think the, the key component there is reflective of what the job requires. You, know, but, you have uh, to physically be able to do it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you mentioned driving the beast. Do you know how much that thing weighs? I'm not allowed to tell. Really? No, Can you give a, a ballpark? I think I can say it's over a certain weight. I don't know. It's very heavy. Yeah. I, mean, I, mean, I can tell you this. If you open the door, it is truly classified, Mike. Uh, we're not allowed to talk about it. But if you open just the door of the beast, just the door width of the, the driver's side, all of the doors are like, it's probably this thick. Wow. So what they do is they take the car from Cadillac. It's always a Cadillac. It gets stripped down. Your Secret Service has actually their own mechanics. It's pretty amazing. Like when you go to like see what they do with the cars, then they come in and they do their stuff to the beast. They put in all their James Bond shit. All of it. It's yeah. literally yes. Yeah. Um, they, they line it. They Kevlar, the, the, the glass, all of it. And I can't say too much. Um, they put all whatever it needs, and they make that thing. That's why it's called a beast because yeah. it's a beast. Yeah. I mean, it's got to be eleven, twelve thousand pounds would be my guess, just based on nope more. What? Yeah, well, more. there, there, there. We at least know it's more than that. More. Uh, can you say what engine is in it? I can't. Yeah. I, I, I appreciate your questions. Yeah. Like I, I'm, I'm still super tight with my U.S. Secret Service yeah. colleagues and the headquarters, and I don't want them calling me yeah. up like, what, what are you saying? You like, say how much horsepower is in it? Do you know, I don't know. Oh, okay. I don't know. It's heavy. Yeah. 
it's a heavy car because of all the weight it has to carry. And to drive that car, there's really super specialized training um, for that, it's especially actually what there's a unique unit, uh, unique unit that's just, they call them TS, and these guys just drive the beast. Yeah. And they go through special training. You have to even, when we travel uh, overseas, they have to measure the distance between the road and the bottom of the beast. There's actually like math computation that goes into like where we take the car to make sure it fits, to make sure it can drive on that road, to make sure that road is sturdy enough to hold the beast. Yeah. There's a lot that goes into it. In fact, when we would go overseas, all our, all our cars and equipment, even our magnetometers, the, the mags that we set up, all comes from the U.S. Wow, that's that's cool. We never use anybody else's vehicles. Yeah, I that, wouldn't want to be in no, yeah, else's it makes vehicles. Sense. Well, I mean, it kind of lends itself to the question of you know why, as a government, whether it's Secret Service, Department of Defense, you name it, is how reliant we are on China for a lot of electronic technology. You know, I mean, to me, that's a, a horrible fucking idea or a horrible scenario we've put ourselves in. But um, can you, you know, say how many cylinders are in the engine? I can't say anything. I can't. I, I, the, the motor head in me is, uh, is curious. I, I, but. You know, I feel you. I love cars. Yeah. It's, it's super classified, and I understand why, because the idea is, I'll say this, the President of the United States is the most vulnerable during arrival and departures when he's in movement. Yeah. If he's in the White House, he's safe. If he's at Starbucks, he's still safe. He's he's indoors. He's safe. So movement is where you're the most vulnerable. So that's where why they keep that so secret. Because if there's an attack on yeah. the beast, if somebody tries to do that, they they really want to mitigate that. Because yeah. you, if you get attacked while you're in those cars, it's just not a good day. For sure. No. I, I and I can. Both I wonder if you could Google it. You I'm sure. Could. Well, yeah. I don't know if it, if you could find the answer, but. Um, I appreciate your your discipline. Uh, you know, you're doing your job. I'm doing mine, right? So no, bring the questions. Yeah, I told yeah. you, ask me anything. Yeah. Um, is there a kind of coolest, sexiest fall guy stunt man skill set that you learned at your entire time at Secret Service? You know what I learned that actually was super simple. It wasn't a stunt. I learned how to use pressure points on people. So they taught us how to handle people without handling people. So, for example, president works a rope line, and a lot of people will grab the president and hug him, and just people just, they forget to let go. Yeah. They zone out. They're just so starch-struck. Uh, so they taught us movements of how to peel people's finger, fingers off, just simple movements like where to press, how to peel, what finger to pull back, what pressure point to put on someone to get them to release. So I, th I thought that was the coolest thing. Do you use that on, on the husband and relatives and well my husband could use it uh, use it on me because he's also <laughs> a former agent yeah. but um yes you can use that it's a, a really good way just pressure points to get people to move or we'd have people trying to block something and um they taught us how to use these pressure points not just with our fingers but we had collapsible batons yeah and those things like you don't want to get hit by one of those things yeah. but they actually taught us how to use and use a collapsible baton and pressure people and Somebody who's in compliant, you get them compliant super quick. Yeah. Did you do much of that for real? Yes. Yeah. Well, we're definitely going to have to get into that here in a bit. Uh, yes. I am curious, the from a kind of a 30,000-foot view of the Secret Service, one thing that I've learned here fairly recently in doing a little bit of research for today's episode is kind of the, the breadth and depth of, in, from an investigation standpoint, how far-reaching the Secret Service is that I think surprises most people. Uh, currency as an example, but can you kind of broad spectrum just talk about all of the different things that the Secret Service does? Yeah, so most people don't know this. U.S. Secret Service was created to combat counterfeit currency yeah. because at the time, Abraham Lincoln's the one who actually created the U.S. Secret Service. At the time, a third of U.S. currency was counterfeit, so it was a problem because it was destroying the economy. So on April 14th, 1865, the same day he was actually assassinated, Abraham Lincoln signed and created the U.S. Secret Service. It's kind of ironic because at the time there was no protection. Protection came, I think, three presidents later. I think maybe after 1901, McKinley is when they stepped in to do, and it wasn't even full-time protection, part-time protection of presidents because presidents were starting to be assassinated. So U.S. Secret Service is probably, I think the oldest agency is U.S. Marshals for fugitives, and then came U.S. Secret Service. Um, so it's a dual mission agency, meaning... They have an investigative arm. Counterfeit money is how it started. 
Uh, today it's bank fraud, financial institution fraud, online fraud, any online fraud, anything that happens online, uh, counterfeit credit cards. Uh, also, a lot of the online stuff would be with child, children, child uh, porn, child um, sexual abuse cases. So anytime there's predators online trying to lure children in, scams, fraud, you know, I, I work cases with eBay and big companies as well. So we, the U.S. Secret Service works with these companies, um, organizations, and then at the same time, you're doing protection. So protection is current president, former presidents, first ladies, former first ladies, they get it for life. And then we also protect foreign heads of state. So if the President Putin comes to the U.S., uh, prime, you know, he comes to the U.S., he gets protection. So the deal is you take a bullet, bullet for Putin or whoever comes to the U.S. So protection kind of takes a big breath. It's not just the man that everybody's focused on. It's also cabinet members, some of them, Department of Homeland Security, protection. Um, Secretary of Tre um, Treasury, protection. So that, it's a dual mission agency. So while you're doing protection, you're also doing search warrants, arrest warrants, working your cases. You're busy. Yeah. You're busy. No, no day is boring there. Oh, I can imagine. It seems like there'd be a lot of overlap, uh, especially like on the financial investigation stuff with FBI. You know, how, how do you guys kind of deconflict that and jurisdiction wise sort that all out? There would always be overlap because there would happen. It would happen. I would be working a financial fraud case. And then unbeknownst to me, FBI is working it. He's working. I'm working. He's working. And then all of a sudden we bump into each other. Now it's like, well, I've been working it. I've been working it. How do we do it? Sometimes, I don't want to say sometimes, sometimes we would acquiesce and let the FBI be the lead because we were doing so much. Sometimes we'd say, hey, look at how much we've done. You could be part of it. So there would be that kind of ego back and forth. It's my case. It's my case. Which is sad. It shouldn't be that way. We should all be players. We're all for collective goal. But that would happen where whose case is it? I never liked that because in the end, we're all working towards the same thing. It just depended who you got. If I got a good FBI guy or a gal, they'd be like, yeah, man, let's just work together. If you got somebody who was difficult, it could be a Then problem. it's pressure points. and uh, It's pressure points. And then be going into the boss. Yeah. And then how strong was my boss to say, no, this is Evie's case or no, this is this. So sometimes it would come down to politics. So there's not a hierarchy default. It, it's all those intangibles that are going to dictate who gets what. It depends on how much you did. Yeah. The only time there was a hierarchy where it was like, it's a U.S. Secret Service, counterfeit money, because it was U.S. Secret Service, protection, obviously, any intelligence towards threats against the president. It could be like, if it was I want to blow up New York, not us. But if it was I want to blow up New York and kill the president, then it'd be us. Yeah. So there were certain cases or things that were really exclusively us. But yes, you're correct. Like a lot of times you cross over. Yeah. And look, criminals don't stay in one lane. Yeah. I'd be working counterfeit money. There'd be drugs. So that'd be, hey, DEA, there's drugs here. Criminals just, they, 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 they do all sorts of things. Yeah. So you may, so one criminal may be investigated by Multiple four agencies. branches. They usually don't, cr criminals don't typically stay in one lane. If it's drugs, it's gangs, it's money, it's fraud. That, you know, there was one record label that escapes me. It was a huge case and it was a le legitimate record label and they did music, hip hop. I think they had Mariah Carey on, on them, but they were founded uh, initially with counterfeit money. They were using counterfeit money and credit card fraud, I believe, uh, to create this label. And then the label launched and it got, it grew into this legit, le uh, excuse me, label, rec recording label. But because it was founded with um, proceeds of a crime, Everybody came in. Every acronym was involved. Wow. And they, they shut it down. I don't know if they shut it down, but it, I want to say we did. Jeez. I, I had no idea. I'd never heard that. Yeah. Um, as far as so going through uh, some of the currency stuff, does that does there cross over into like Federal Reserve, Fort Knox, like that, that kind of stuff? Like a Secret Service have any involvement in any of that kind of stuff? Sometimes I think we would work with the reserve because they would make the money. And so the, the counterfeit fee, they would put features, security features in the money. So we would work, I know we would work closely with them to understand what security features they would put in. The U.S. Secret Service would guide them as to what was being scammed or replicated. We actually went to the Federal Reserve in the, when I was in training, they took us oh, wow. in Washington, D.C. to show us the money, to show us how it's printed. It's pretty amazing. Grab some souvenirs. No, they didn't let me. <laughs> A couple they didn't sheets. Let me. Yeah. 
do you know, uh, to, to, these are kind of off the wall questions that probably don't Shoot. have shit to do with the, your line of work, but do you know how much US, how many U.S. dollars are actually in circulation? Is it a couple I, trillion? I mean, do you even know? I don't know. Mm-hmm. I used to know. I yeah. don't know, and I, I'm sure that number's changed because, I mean, and you could, I, I do the news now. I cover news, um, crime, criminal justice, national security. So just being in the newsroom or hearing the different stories, I do know we, we printed a lot of money, Yeah. and that plays a role in inflation. So yeah. I think we have um, some massive circulation issues. Yeah. Um, one of the, the protection things I'll, I'll, I'll ask after this, I guess, since this is kind of, uh, kind of related when you're going through training, is there an emphasis put on your personal politics and leaving it out? Like, do they talk about that? Yeah. You don't talk about politics. I mean, agreed, but I, I guess I'm curious, is that part of your training where they emphasize like, Hey, I don't like nobody should know what side you of the fence you're on or, or what have you like you leave that out. So, you know, they didn't do that in training, I think, because there was an understanding, an informal understanding amongst all of us. You don't do that. I could see them doing it now because people talk and you're not supposed to. The idea is you're supposed to be neutral because you have a Republican president, a Democratic president, whoever, and you're not supposed to pick a side. You can vote. Um, but you're not supposed to, and, and guys and gals would share their opinions within the group, within us, but you have to keep in mind, we knew these people. So when we voted or someone voted, I actually didn't vote. I wanted to stay super neutral. I think I voted, voted once my whole life. Um, but when you, you don't want to be attached to the person because you're, you're it's like you're, you're, you're there for the office of the president, the symbol of it. But we were told outside Again, you weren't told, but it was understood, like outside of these circles, you don't talk about who you vote for because you're going to, there's credibility in what you say, because if I'm behind the scenes, that means I know something. So if I say to you, I'm only going to vote for this guy, then you as a civilian is going to think, well, she must know something that I don't know. So I'm going to vote for who she says. And so there would be that our influence over politics. And we were not supposed to do that. Also, you're really supposed to be neutral. It shouldn't matter who's in office. Your job there is to protect whoever gets that position. Yeah. I, I certainly understand all that. I do think there is relevance in understanding kind of the, the consensus of agents who are privy to things that nobody else gets to see. And, and to me, it, it is at least curious, if not, I, I think, honestly, kind of beneficial of knowing who Secret Service agents would be voting for or not voting for. You know, uh, because the one of the, I think, bitches that a lot of regular citizens who don't have that access, you know, or have some heartburn about is, is that, is that, you know, they're, they're seeing a facade brochure bullshit version of this person, whereas you guys don't. Um, and I know there's a million NDAs that are indefinite and, and, you know, a lot of the details that you can't talk about. I'm still going to ask you, of course, but. You absolutely um, can. You know, we didn't have NDAs till recently. Really? Because it was, we were taken on our word. It was just understood you don't talk. We were, I mean, that was a great thing about that agency for years. I mean, since its inception, you know, its creation, there was no NDAs. And then somebody went and started speaking about politics, and that's when the NDAs came. Yeah. Um, in terms of some of the protection stuff, one of the questions that popped in uh, in my head as you were talking, when you're talking about all the different people you protect, how far does it go with first family stuff? Like, say... Uh, Bush's daughters. I mean, they're grown women now with their own families. Like, do they still have security details? No, they don't. I actually had uh, Laura Bush. I had President Bush's daughter for a while. Um, I had her towards her tail end when her father was finishing, and then um, they extended protection for for her even after he left. So the way it works is once a president is gone from office, children no longer get protection. It stops. With him, with his daughter, at that time, both of them, because when he left, there were a lot of threats against him. When he left office, people were very angry, the wars, different things. So they were able to determine that there were enough threats to keep protection. So I stayed on actually with Laura Bush. She's one of the twins up until the end. I was the last agent that had her. In fact, the, when her, her, um, the day her protection ended, before it ended, I took her around. I was like, you don't, she never been on her own. Eight years her dad was president. Before that, governor of Texas, she had 
protection there from the state troopers, she had never been on her own. And so I was actually genuinely, I remember going to my boss in the Secret Service. I'm like, she's not going to know what to do. He's like, well, it's, it's nothing we can do. It's not a, he didn't say it's not our problem, but it's not the taxpayer's problem. So I remember as it was coming up, I prepped her. We literally did, I showed her like uh, the hard houses. I'm like, this is where you go if you need help. Uh, this is the, the safe houses. These are the fire departments. Here's the police departments. I mean, I did all of that with her um, because I wanted to leave her capable because we were really, really going to leave her so vulnerable. And in fact, the day after her protection ended, the very next day she was traveling overseas. She had never traveled overseas on her own. She didn't know what to do, wow. how to check in because we always bypassed. And so that day, I remember I took off that day and as a civilian, not in my duties, I took her to the airport and I took her as a, a friend and I'm like, let me show you what to do. She wow. didn't know what to do. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that would be tough. I mean, cause you get to know, especially the kids, you know, I mean, they're kids and you get to know them and you spend a lot of time. You don't want to see anything bad happen. That would be, that would be dicey. I mean, I imagine them now as, I mean, what they're in their mid thirties, late thirties and yes. they, they have kids of their own and they're just out in the public, you know, that, that would be dicey. I would think, you know, even now, I mean, as, as removed as he is from office, um, that would be nerve wracking, I would think, but it is uncomfortable. I would think, especially for them as parents, which is why they ended up accepting extending protection. It's money. Yeah, who's going to pay for it? Look, I also think that the I could say this with the twins, and I don't think they'd mind. Like Jen and Barbara were ready to be done with us. To have somebody on you, growing up, watching your every, every move, it was hard for them growing up, and I that was one of the reasons they gave me Laura because she just was like, I'm done with protection, and so. I think for them, I was a, I think I was the first woman to have her. Oh wow! Or the only woman I, I couldn't be, but that was their thinking. Maybe she needs a woman. Yeah. And so I grabbed her. I'm like, listen. I was like, she lived in New York at the time, and you know she used to try to kind of didn't want always protection. I said, listen, I will take you anywhere you want to go. You want to go to the clubs? I know where the clubs are. I grew up here. You want to go to Webster Hall? I was like, I'll take you to the DJ booth. I said, just stay with me. Don't ditch me. Don't jump turnstiles. Don't take the subway. I will take you shopping for booze. You want to go to liquor stores? I'm there with you. Just stay with me. And, you know, we even went to Coachella. I didn't even know what a Coachella was. It's like some big <laughs> music festival. She's like, we're going to Coachella. I was like, great, what's Coachella? And um, so I had established a great relationship with her because that's important because people want, have to want to be protected and sometimes they don't. Yeah. Well, so that makes me curious then. Uh, in an instance where there's conflict between you and who you're protecting, you know, where there's a disagreement on, no, I'm doing this. No, I'm not. Especially if it's a minor, where, where does that hierarchy fall down? If, if they say, you know, get away from me, like, you, I don't want you here. I'm going this and, and you're not invited or like what, what kind of badge weight gets thrown around and, and what, who makes that decision? I'm calling your dad. Yeah. <laughs> That was that's really what, that's it. what happened. It would happen. We'd call dad or mom yeah. up. But that's we, what that's what would have to happen. Like if if she was hell bent enough on saying get away from me, we would call up. I would I would call up my immediate supervisor. I would go up the chain of command. Like everything, I'm like, hey man, I need help, and uh, I'm thankful I didn't have that issue. I know other agents had those issues. Um, it goes up the chain of command, and I mean, it would happen with different things. It even happened overseas. I remember once I was in Botswana. I was out there a month in advance to do the advance work for First Lady, then First Lady Michelle Obama, who was going to go visit. But I had gone a month out. I was doing the operations, the everything, the visas, the weapons, all of it. And so I'm there by myself with the State Department and the government officials. And she's going to Botswana. She's going to South Africa. And everything was going through South Africa, I remember, at the time. And South Africa was not playing nice. They were giving me a hard time about everything. And it finally came to the point where... They're supposed to play nice. They were, we're counterparts. We're trying to do this trip. Came to the point where I called my supervisors and I said, you got to talk to the president. I don't think she should come now. I'm like, I can't secure her safety. And it came to that. It came to my supervisors um, going to the president saying, we don't think she go to South Africa. They're not, they're not working with us. We can't secure, you know, ensure her safety. And so president <laughs> called South Africa and said, you either play or she's not coming. So then I got what I wanted. Yeah. Wow. So sometimes it comes down to that. Yeah. So w with that, for what you can share, I mean, when, when the president and first lady go to other countries, how does the whole weapons thing work? Is it just kind of a, a professional courtesy that 
and same when they come here is that they have some of their people here that are armed and, and you just allow, they allow it, we allow it, et cetera. I will say that when we when we go overseas, you take your weapon. We take our weapons with you. We work it out. It's, ne- it's a negotiation process. How many will you let us have? They even count ammo. Oh wow! They count they count the ammo. There's been it was one trip where we got off the plane. They weren't supposed to do do it. We worked it out, and they're like, "No, we're going to count your ammo." And at that point, you want to like pound somebody's head through a wall. It's like, "Hey, we worked through this," but sometimes you're at the mercy of these governments. So. Typically, if we have good relations, a good State Department rep, a strong one, because that matters, we negotiate weapons, how much ammo, um, and all that. It's like, hey, these are the, you, you, you show, like, this is how much personnel I'm going to bring in. And it's interesting because you have to share information, but to a point, because then every country spies, every country tries to mimic or replicate what you do. Um, so you have to be super careful. So it's always a negotiation. And when they come to the U.S., it's the same thing. I do think when they come to the U.S., because we secure them to such a degree, and, and that's, I think, why it's another reason why we want to secure them. We don't bring your guns. But they will bring, and we allow for that to some extent. There, it's a, all a negotiation process. Who are you? Why should you be armed? That yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I, I could be mistaken, but Putin has been in the White House, right? I believe so. So in an instance like that, where, or let's just say generically, a guy like that is in the White House meeting with our president, do they have, like, would he have his own armed security guys in our White House? I can't say if his people, I don't think, I don't know if I'm allowed to answer that, okay. whether they're armed or not in the White House. That I can't, I don't want to say anything, but he will have a security team with him. Yeah. I mean, I went, I actually took, the, head, the Secretary of Treasury Paulson to the Crump, to, to Putin actually. Um, and same thing, we have a security detail, we do stuff. And actually working with the Russians, they're tough, they were hard. In fact, I remember going in with my detail and as I'm going through with my motorcade, his security team shut the gates on my motorcade in the middle of my motorcade and I about lost my mind. Mm. Like he um, split your motorcade. He split my motorcade out so I've got my protectee on one side of the gate with his folks, and I've got harsh part of my protective detail behind us. And so now you got to sit and go figure. And, you know, Russia's kind of like, screw you, because we probably do the same. I don't want to say we've done that to them. I don't think we've done that to them. I, want, I will say in the U.S., we were always very professional with whoever, whatever country we had. I was never told, screw with them, do this with them. Never, 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 never. We really worked very hard to be good liaisons. In fact, you had to be very, it's a law enforcement position, but you had to also be, you were a diplomatic liaison. So how you spoke, how you represented, we would go to embassies and have meetings consistently with their ambassadors or their head people. So you were also in this pseudo diplomatic, I mean, I had a diplomatic passport. You were you were a liaison for the US government. So you would, you would also be part of those negotiations and with the State Department as well. Wow. Um, were there governments that when they hosted you guys would, would play games like that? Russia. I mean, Russia for but, sure. When I went there, they when I went to check into that, and I wanted to say it was a Marriott, my room wasn't ready. There were people coming <laughs> the, in, checking in after me. The bugs aren't planted yet. Yes. Yeah. And so everyone's coming in, getting checked in, and I'm waiting for like an hour, two hours, and I'm like, why can't I get in? Your room is not ready. And um, I knew when I went to my room, and they told me, State Department's like, your room's going to be bugged. Just know that. Nothing's safe in your safe. I put nothing in my safe. In fact, even to this day, I put nothing in a safe. Um, and sometimes they would mess with you. It didn't happen to me. But they would go to your room so that you, they, you knew they were in your room. They would use the toilet mm. and leave you something so that when you got back. <laughs> that you knew somebody was in there? Yes. Like they'd take they a dump or they'd. One of the two. <laughs> So there were times there was a, a fresh yes. deuce in the toilet. <laughs> the <laughs> Russians would do that. A oh, Russian, yes. Russian submarine. There were countless stories of those. They didn't do, drop me one of those, but I do remember once I put like something stupid in my safe just to see, and when I came back, I couldn't open it. My code uh, didn't work, and I yeah. knew they had gone in there. Yeah. So how does that, I mean, I'm assuming it's the same, like if our president is in a foreign place, like his room is bugged. There's, I mean, cameras that like, to me, like, I mean, it, I don't give a shit who you are. If you're in a hotel room, like, and there's video and, but like, there's going to be some compromising shit. Yes. Um, 
<clears throat> All I can say is that we, the, they have a sophisticated system. We have a sophisticated system set up in which they go out in advance um, and they check for all of that, all of that. Also, sometimes, too, they also know, protectees know not to have certain conversations yeah. uh, in those areas or spaces. They know that they're not secure. So as much as we do, which we do, just in case something slips or you just don't know, man. But technology, China, these countries are very smart, brilliant. In fact, with China, they would tell us, if you bring your device to China, just know it's going to get compromised. So we wouldn't bring our devices or our laptops to China. Yeah. So, yeah, if anybody wants to know, as soon as you cross into China, just know your stuff is it's compromised. And yeah. if you may be okay with it. By compromise, you mean just they're accessing it? Yes. or And is it yes. for for good after Probably. that? Yeah. Like they've, so. they've put something. In fact, when we would come from overseas, they would take... You were mandatory right away to go with your devices to, um, cause you had to have your phone, right? So we would have to go one, they would, they would put something on our phone before we went to a specific country, every country, they'd be like, where are you going? And they do something to our phones. Again, I can't say, but security features to our phones. And then when we come back, same thing, you go straight to, um, our IT team. We had a really great IT, IT team. They take your phone and check it, debug it. Sometimes it'd be like, this thing's garbage. You can't use this anymore because of what, you know, um, they tried to put on your phone. Somebody doesn't physically have to have your phone to do something to it. Yeah. So, you, you know, oh. it's something to keep in mind, especially for people in business. Yeah. When they go overseas to certain countries, they're spying on you. Sure. If you're an entrepreneur going. Bring uh, the burner. In fact, there was this one story they told us about. I remember one of my training, just we had continual training when they were telling us about IT and there was a, a politician who ordered a computer, uh, I think it, a computer, the computer parts, I won't say what company, but the computer parts were manufactured in China and they knew it was somehow, they knew it was going to this politician who ordered this computer, because you're gonna order a computer, right? And they put uh, bugs on that computer so that when this politician got this computer, they could spy on yeah. the politician. Thankfully, it was caught, and they removed it. But yeah. Two questions. One, yes. uh, going back to the, the hotel room scenario. The toilet? <laughs> well, not the toilet. Uh, we've talked enough about Russian shit, I think, today. Um, it, when you when the, the D-sweep uh, team rolls through, let's say this is going to be the president's room. Yes. They go through, and they find a bunch of stuff. Are they re removing it? Are they just saying, hey, just so you know, this stuff is here. Are they covering it up? Is there a, a confrontation to now the host nation of saying like, hey, what the fuck? This is our president's room and we found all this stuff. Like, You're not going to confront. Think about it because we do the same thing. Yeah. I, I can't. Everybody spies on everybody. Just everybody. So sometimes when people are like, oh, America, we should be like, nope. Everybody spies on us, and if we want to know what's going on, we need to be doing the same thing. I think that they, I don't know that they, I will, it's not smart to confront. I don't think they ever confront. I do think they'll, again, I have to be careful as to what they do. I think they decide how to handle the stuff, whether they're going to leave it or take it out. I do think they make certain decisions, um, but I do know, pretty sure that they do not confront. Yeah. We don't. We don't want you to know what we know. Right. So if you think you're getting one over on us, even better. Yeah. Well, and I suppose uh, just by saying we know this is here, you're telling, I'm telling showing your, my hands. Yeah, you're t showing your hands. And if I want to mislead another country, what great way to say, oh, there's listening devices. Let me have a conversation about X that's not true and let them think it's true. Yeah. And let them put their the resources somewhere else. Double, triple, quadruple cross game. Yes. Uh, in, in an instant where... Let's say our president is in uh, a foreign nation that's kind of dicey that way. You know there's a bunch of listening stuff, what have you, and something transpires that requires a national security level meeting, discussion, et cetera. Is he going back on Air Force One to have that? Like he's not gonna, they're not gonna circle the wagons in his hotel room, right? Or would they? The vehicles are secure. So they'd go to a vehicle and talk? Our vehicles are secure. Yeah. That's all I can say is because all the vehicles come from the United States. So you guys fly them over there. The beast. Yeah. There's multiple beasts. Um, the vehicles, his vehicles, our vehicles, even the Secret Service, the follow-up, all our stuff. We bring all our toys. Yeah. Okay. And so you know that our stuff is secure. Yeah. I tell people when they ask me about active shooters or schools or different things, I tell them, hide behind a curtain. Hide behind a poster. If they can't see you, 
it's 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 way better than just being exposed. Don't just look for cover. 